Good evening. Co-chair of the Board of Trustees of the Armenian Assembly of America, Antony Barsamian, is in our studio tonight. Mr. Barsamian, welcome to Armenia and thank you for doing the interview. Thank you, Ashley. Mr. Barsamian, you've been meeting with state dignitaries. You've already met the president. You're about to meet the foreign minister. You've met the ambassador of the U.S. What's on the agenda of these meetings? I mean, the whole discussion right now is about Artsakh and the blockade. Uh, this is just untenable that, uh, that we have 120,000 Armenians still under blockade six months later. The U.S. has been... Uh, inactive in terms of their in the peace process, but it's time to open the blockade. Uh, the United Nations has condemned it. Uh, the United States has condemned it. Europe has condemned it. Uh, it's time for the parties to act. This is where we are right now. We need some action. I'd like to begin by talking about Armenia government and diaspora relations first and foremost. Azerbaijan threatens our borders daily, as you mentioned, and K Armenians are facing a blockade, which is basically a tool of ethnic cleansing. Um, this is a critical time for Armenia and diaspora to join forces. But what we see is that the visits of the High Commissioner Sinanyan and even Prime Minister Pashinyan were quite hindered abroad. Um, is there a realization among the diaspora to full extent of what challenges Armenia, our statehood, as well as the Armenians in NK are facing? And if yes, then why do we not see the same unity among the diaspora as uh, when it comes to restoring historic justice and fighting for it? That's a good question. So the Armenian Assembly never interferes internally with Armenia's politics. So we work with every government of Armenia. Uh, I think there needs to be a, a break here and a realignment. I think what we need is for a sit down with some of our uh, leaders in the diaspora, certainly Armenian Americans, and uh, those in government here. We have to align our values. Right now, there's a crisis, which we know, and everyone is very concerned. So what I'm telling people is enough of the talk of what we cannot do. We have to critically analyze what we can do. So it's time to look at our situation and say these are the most important things. Uh, there are some very good things happening. Um, you're, you're seeing countries step up and work with, with uh, Armenia, India, Iran, the United States, the European countries, South American countries, and Russia. But the question is, to what degree? So it's time for realignment with these countries, with our real partners, those who are going to work with us. And I think even Armenians in America and elsewhere need to come to Armenia and have very frank talks with the government. And that's what we do. We have very direct talks with the ministers, with their staff, and we've done this for years. So we understand their position. Behind closed doors, we share our position. The U.S. has been gearing up for more peace talks recently. The foreign ministers of Armenia and Azerbaijan met in Washington recently for a second round of peace talks um, under the facilitation of the U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken and assistant to the president and national security advisor Jake Sullivan. Does this high-level official involvement in the peace process, as well as a recent in intensification of peace talks, suggest that the U.S. is going to see through peace in South Caucasus? We hope there is peace. The problem is Armenia is not uh, the, the one who's hindering peace. Uh, Secretary Blinken and, uh, and um, National Security Advisor Solomon I believe are working in great uh, good faith to do the right thing. The problem is they want a deal and they want a deal and they're pushing Armenia. They're putting too much pressure on Armenia. The pressure needs to be put on Azerbaijan. And they are saying we are just neutral facilitators. There, there is no neutral facilitation. There is Armenia is a democracy and Azerbaijan is an autocracy. You see in Ukraine, the U.S. is supporting and, and the West is supporting the democracy. Here again, there is no neutral position. Um, the U.S., the West needs to do the same thing. It needs to support Armenia as a democracy against an authoritative government. So in saying that, I believe that um, what happened last week in the Congress, we had something called the Lantos Commission. And what that was, was David Phillips and people like Michael Rubin 
appeared before Congress and were very direct. And what they did is they put on record that this blockade is illegal, that you have something called the Humanitarian Corridors Act that the Armenian Assembly worked to pass in the United States that says no country can block others receiving aid who received aid in the past. So Artsakh received aid in the past. Right now, uh, the Azeris are blocking that aid. So under the Humanitarian Aid Corridors Act, the President of the United States has the right to stop all assistance to Azerbaijan and should. So the, the, what's happening is in Artsakh, um, the temperature is rising. They continue the blockade. Now it's an absolute full blockade. Everyone knows it. The Europeans know it. The UN knows it. America knows it. Russia knows it. What are we going to do? It's interesting. David Phillips was very direct, and I, I, I applaud him for this. He basically called out Israel and said, this is a betrayal of your history. By Israel helping Azerbaijan, they're betraying their own history of the Holocaust. Let's break that down a little bit. We have very good friends, uh, Jewish American friends in the United States. The Federation, or, or, uh, the Federation in Boston and, and uh, Los Angeles said, we can no longer tolerate this, this blockade of Artsakh. It is the beginning of ethnic cleansing. And they feel it on their skin because they, they've, they've dealt with this in their own history. You know, it, Elie Wiesel uh, had a, a, um, a speech once. It was on April 12th, uh, 1999, called The Perils of Indifference. And in that speech, let me quote, he said, he compared the Holocaust to the events in Kosovo. And what he said is action uh, is the only remedy to indifference. Inaction is the most insidious danger of all. Well, what's happening? The UN, no action. The US is pushing, but yet no action on the ground. Even Russia is standing back. So my job as an advocate for Armenia and for Artsakh is to say, we need action. This is the moment. Otherwise, we are going to face a second genocide. Israel needs to listen to the Jewish community in the United States and elsewhere around the world and stop this. Stop supplying weapons to Azerbaijan because they will now be a party to genocide in Artsakh. Back to the peace talks. We have seen decades of peace talks crumble into dust and end in war, basically. Do you have any optimism that this time it's going to end differently? I think there can be peace, but the one thing we're reminding everyone is that President Aliyev can say something is so, but it isn't so. So by him saying it, it doesn't mean that Europe, the United States, Russia, or anyone else has to agree with it. In a, and I've said this before, in a peace deal, there needs to be goodwill on both sides to give up something. President Aliyev knows that Artsakh needs to be autonomous from Azerbaijan. It cannot be under Azerbaijan. No way. Armenia is already giving up a lot. So the fact is, it's time now for President Aliyev to get real. If he wants true peace, which is doubtful, but if he does want true peace, he will need to give up some things, allow the Lachin to open, and allow Armenians free flow from Artsakh to Armenia. What you mean by giving up something is basically compromise, which we do not see Azerbaijan do. That's true. And herein is the crux of the problem. If they want stability in the region, everyone will need to compromise. If they want instability, where there'll be no investment in Azerbaijan, in Armenia, in Georgia, we can continue with instability. But I believe there is a chance here right now for everyone in this region to work together, but there needs to be some compromise. Uh, as of now, I'll be honest, I don't hear the rhetoric at least. And also we have POWs. Armenia still has POWs held in Azerbaijan. That needs to stop immediately. The agreement calls for it. It also calls for UNHCR to go into Artsakh. It's gonna, uh, we've been pushing for USAID to, to enter into Artsakh. There needs to be aid uh, programs and we need good reporting. We can't get good reporting in Artsakh because no one is allowed in. Only the the United uh, the International Red Cross is welcome in 
And, and even at that is limited at this moment. True, not even international organizations, no fact-checking missions, nothing not can enter all. Artsakh. Uh, Mr. Barsamian, what is the function of the Armenian lobby and the diaspora? What tools of influence do you have to um, help enhance the possibility of peace? The Armenian Assembly works every day in Washington. We have a Washington office. We work with all of our friends, both Republican and Democrats, in Congress, we work with the administration, we work with the National Security Council and State Department. So our job is to be honest brokers, to behind closed doors, tell them clearly what we see on the ground. So we will have an assessment. Uh, I'll travel to Goris and travel to the border. I'll take a look. I'll talk to monitors, the European monitors and others. The idea for us is to talk to all parties, keep our door open. Obviously, we talk to the entire Armenian community all political parties, opposition, and the, the party in, in the ruling party here in Armenia. But our job, first and foremost, is to be honest with everyone, including the United States, to find solutions. We need a solution to this blockade immediately. And there is no, no negotiating at this point. There needs to be a solution to the blockade of 120,000 Armenians. Azerbaijan <laughs> is obviously trying to put off negotiations on the Washington platform with the US presidential elections in view, or at least that's the impression that we get here. Under Biden administration, Azerbaijan is having to negotiate over a number of agenda that is not its own, that is demarcation and delimitation, baku Stepanagert dialogue, withdrawal of troops from occupied territories, peace treaty, and international mechanisms of guaranteeing the implementation of the peace treaty. In other words, under the Republicans, Azerbaijan is signing to an agenda not entirely its own. Um, what will the fate of the peace treaty be in case the Democrats win? So if the Democrats win, we continue with a very strong uh, policy of bringing the parties to the table and looking to find compromise on both sides. I'm not even worried about the Republicans. In the Lantos Commission, uh, former Senator Brownback, who was a Republican, was one of the champions. So you're starting to see that among the Republicans, they too want to see a resolution to this. This is now intense negotiations. Democrats and Republicans are pushing at the table for Armenians and Azeris to come to a solution. But that solution is really in one man's hand and that's Ilama Aliyev, that he would have to very directly start backing off the rhetoric and start negotiating in good faith and bring peace. There's no way to bring peace to the region by blockading 120,000 people. Inch by inch, step by step, they're pressuring uh, the Armenians of Artsakh, and that's not gonna end well for him because they're not going anywhere. We talk to those in Artsakh, they are, rooted in that land, they are not leaving. Do you yourself consider the cooperation with the government of Armenia functional? Yes, first of all, we cannot co cooperate with the government. We listen to their agenda, they listen to our agenda, and hopefully our agendas align. So as a, as a US advocacy organization, we advocate for Armenians and the Armenian people, and that is our job. So we work with Congress, we work with the administration to have uh, an open, positive, and healthy U.S.-Armenia relationship. About U.S.-Armenia relationship, Secretary of Security Council Armen Grigorian will leave for the U.S. to discuss Armenia-U.S. relations with Jake Sullivan. What should we expect from this visit? I think every time uh, a, a, an Armenian official travels to the United States, there's more that can be put on the table. So there's a basket and um, I think the uh, National Security Advisor should be very direct, ask for certain things that Armenia needs, and also ask that they block uh, Azerbaijan from receiving any assistance. Because until the Lachin is open, they have a legal right to, not, to ask uh, or to impose on Azerbaijan a block of any, any assistance. But he should clearly uh, highlight the fact that Armenia is a democracy, that it's working in good faith, it has very good partners, and uh, even among the region, I see the partnerships develop further. India, you're seeing more airlines open to Armenia. So we are progressing here, but we need the US support. We need Europe's support. French government has been very supportive, 
and they'll continue to be supportive. Now we need the other nations, including Russia. I still believe in the OSCE Minsk group process. So I would, I would like to see soon the uh, Russians join uh, the United States and France at the table. Mr. Barsamian, how long do you plan to stay in Armenia? And again, what's the plan of the visit? Oh, well, it, it's, it's helpful for me. Uh, my wife is teaching nursing. There's a major medical congress here. So she's here for two weeks. I usually come for four or five days, so I'll be departing on Friday. But it's a pleasure to always come back to Armenia, and I'll be back soon. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you. Co-chair of the Board of Trustees of the Armenian Assembly of America, Antony Barsamian, was in our studio tonight. Mm -hmm.